Welcome everyone to tonight's environmental justice and carbon sequestration panel discussion. Um, thank you for coming this evening. It's great to see a, a full house here. We even have opened up our overflow room uh, out there. So it's, a, um, it's great to see you all this evening. Uh, my name is Nate Olson. I'm the Associate Director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics. I'm very much looking forward to uh, tonight's discussion. Um, I would like to welcome CSUB's Provost, Dr. Vernon Harper, to offer some introductory remarks. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this really, really important event. Uh, it is always so joyous to see so many people uh, come out for the Kegley Institute lectures. Uh, they're so very important and foundational to what we do here as a community. Of course, I want to thank uh, the faculty, staff, and students uh, that uh, brought this event about. Give them a round of applause. Uh, of course, I want to thank Dr. Jacqueline Kegley for her gracious support of this event and the Institute. She deserves the most applause for everything that she has done for this institution over multiple decades. And of course, uh, Michael Burroughs, Nate, and Callie for their uh, incredible support. But there's one really group of individuals uh, that I really want to recognize, and that is our soon-to-be students who did the outstanding artwork that we all viewed uh, entering the facility. Give those stu soon-to-be students a round of applause. Just really wonderful to see that. Carbon management is so critical to the future of not just Kern County, but the future of California and our nation. And uh, at CSUB, energy innovation is a really ex important focal point of not just our scholarship, our pedagogy, and uh, how we approach the service to our community. We have a number of faculty who are experts in the different dimensions of energy and innovation, including one of today's panelists. And we look forward to the creation of our new energy and innovation center uh, that will play a really, really significant uh, role in the physical footprint of the university. Dean Dong is here. She'll be leading that effort. Give her a round of applause. We appreciate her work in that particular space. It is imperative to make sure that as a community, we discuss the ethical dimensions of new technologies, such as those we see with carbon management, Community conversations like these are what the Kegley Institute of Eth Ethics are, are designed and are specialized for. The, this panel came together through a co collaboration between the Kegley Institute of Ethics and the California Energy Research Center, led by Tony Rathburn. Give him a round of applause for his outstanding work in that space. And I want to thank the experts on this panel from CSUB, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. The panel will be moderated by KE, KIE Associate Director, Dr. Nate Olson, who will in introduce our panelists. Dr. Olson. Thank you, Provost Harper. As Provost Harper mentioned, carbon management is an important topic for the future of Kern County. Currently, there's several carbon capture and storage projects under review in our county, and there are many organizations and companies and a lot of individuals in our community who believe that this is central to the future of um, Kern County energy and think that Kern County will be a world leader in this technology. If you don't know anything about carbon management or carbon sequestration, don't worry. Uh, this partly with this panel is to explain and think about, we'll talk about today, what are some of the different aspects of this technology. Um, and as with any new technology, we also need to consider its ethical dimensions. Tonight's panel will also introduce you to different environmental justice issues related to carbon management and carbon sequestration. I teach an environmental philosophy class. And one of the things that I tell my environmental philosophy students is that Part of environmental justice is participative justice. That means that everyone who's impacted by technologies, everyone who's impacted by things that we're thinking about in our community needs to have a say in a part of discussions that we have about that. So that's what the big part of tonight's panel is all about. It's a community conversation. We have our, a, a group of expert panelists up here who are each gonna talk for about 10 minutes or so and um, introduce different aspects 
of carbon sequestration as well as environmental justice. And then we're gonna open it up to questions from you all. Um, we've got people here in this room, we've got in our overflow room, and we also have people attending on Zoom. So we'll have uh, plenty of opportunity for audience questions after each panelist gives a, a brief presentation. Um, as Provost Harper mentioned, this panel would not have come together without some wonderful collaborators. Uh, 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 Dr. Rathburn came to us last summer with the idea of talking about issues related to environmental justice and carbon sequestration. Uh, he's been a wonderful collabor collaborator in putting together this event. Um, I wanted to mention too that uh, the California Energy Research Center next Friday, April 21st, is going to be doing um, a carbon management technical symposium. Um, and so that event due to limited space is invite only for the in-person aspect of the event, but everyone is welcome to attend on, online on a live stream of that event. Uh, you can register for that at uh, www.csub.edu slash C-E-R-C. I think I got that right. Yeah. Okay. So that's next Friday. Um, so that's that's one aspect. This also, and as you can see out here with the wonderful artwork from kids about kid foxes, that's part this event and that as well are part of CSUB's sustainability symposium, um, which is happening today and tomorrow as well. There's a conference happening. Uh, the keynote tomorrow is by Dr. Rebecca Hernandez from UC Santa Cruz, who's with us today. Um, at 9 a.m., I encourage you to come attend her talk tomorrow in the Student Union Multipurpose Room. Um, her talk is titled Sustainability, Diversity, and Student Empowerment. So I'm looking forward to being there tomorrow morning, and it's great to have you here, Dr. Hernandez. Um, I'd also like to recognize uh, Timothy LaFond, who's sitting here in the front row, who's one of our Kegley Institute of Ethics student fellows this year. And this his um, fellowship is focused on different CSUB sustainability initiatives. Uh, he's also the one who's in charge of our Zoom tonight. He'll be taking questions from Q&A, so we'll, we'll hear from Tim a bit later. But thank you, Tim, for all your work on this event. We should give Tim a round of applause. Um, we'd also like to thank our sponsors of Kegley Institute who make all of our events possible, which includes the Kegley family, Valley Strong Credit Union, Adventist Health, and Kaiser Permanente. Okay, I've already mentioned the kind of format of tonight's event. So each of our panelists will talk for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions after that. Um, for questions, you can see there's microphones on each side of the room here. So if you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you line up at those after, after the time, after the panelists have each given their presentation, and I'll call on people at the microphones when we get to the Q&A part, and we'll also take some questions from Zoom. Um, we're also recording tonight's event, and it'll be available on our uh, Kegley Institute of Ethics YouTube page within a few days, so you can see that uh, a few days from now. Okay, I'm very happy to introduce our three expert panelists here. First, Preston Jordan is a geologist in the Energy Geosciences Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He received a BA in geology and a an, uh, master's of science in geotechnical engineering from UC Berkeley. He's a California professional geologist, certified hydrogeologist, and certified engineering geologist. Over the last 15 years, his research focus has been deep subsurface fluid engineering, including geologic carbon sequestration, well stimulation, underground gas storage, and just lately underground hydrogen storage. We were talking about that just a bit before uh, the panel tonight. Um, he's conducted a number of risk reviews of carbon storage projects and has also been a longtime collaborator with faculty here at CCB. So it's, it's great to have you with us tonight. Next, we have Lori Pasante, who is the Civic Education Director for the Dolores Huerta Foundation. In this role, she runs civic engagement and legislative advocacy programming, including work to strengthen democratic functioning. She earned her JD from the UC Hastings College of Law and has worked in a variety of public interest contexts, including the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, the Kern County Public Defender's Office, public employee unions, legal aid organizations, and higher education. Thank you for being with us, Lori. And next we have Niyakundi Micheka, who is Associate Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for Economic Education and Research at CSUB. 
He received his PhD in environmental and natural resource economics from West Virginia University. Dr. Macheka is a prolific researcher whose research focuses on energy economics, energy policy and demand, renewable and non-renewable energy, and our regional economics. Um, so please welcome our three panelists here tonight. And we're gonna start, um, Preston will start us off. Here's, the, here's your clicker. For having me here this evening. Um, I have the, the task of starting us off just with some framing information. Um, for those who may not be familiar with carbon capture and sequestration, uh, it's fairly much what it says, but to break it down, um, it's capturing carbon from any of a variety of source sources. And so that could be a cement plant, um, that could be a bio waste power plant, that could actually be a facility that takes CO2 directly from the air. Um, called direct air capture. So the sequestration part is agnostic in terms of where the CO2 comes from. It could come from any of those facilities. The sequestration part is putting it under the ground. And what does that mean? It's essentially finding locations that are similar to or actually locations where oil and gas accumulated and putting the CO2 into those locations because those volumes have been shown by nature to be able to retain a buoyant fluid that otherwise wants to come to the surface for millions and millions of years. Uh, so there are some projects that propose to simply put CO2 back into an oil reservoir that has been mostly evacuated of the oil. There are other projects that propose to put CO2 into uh, what's called a saline reservoir. So this is a reservoir or a porous rock that's filled with salt water. Um, and there is a piece in between that doesn't make it into uh, that acronym, which is the transportation. The early projects are tending not to have so much transportation uh, because in California and the, in the Central Valley, um, there are so many good locations to uh, sequester carbon dioxide in the subsurface that many of the facilities that are some of the first facilities to move towards capturing their CO2 actually directly overlie um, a good reservoir for putting the CO2. And so they don't need to transport the CO2. They're going to uh, put it in a well on their facility. Um, so the, the depths vary. They're, they're generally always over 3,000 feet. And there's some uh, reasons in physics for that having to do with CO2, which I won't go into. Um, so 3,000 feet or say a mile into the subsurface, that can seem like a, a long distance or a short distance. I mean, obviously it doesn't take long to go a mile across the, uh, the surface of the earth. I just walked a mile over here from the, the hotel. Um, so I thought I'd give some, some framing around that. Uh, the difference is you're going through rock. And so when the fluid, water, or other gases or liquids are moving through the rock, it, there's a tremendous amount of friction in the pores of the rock because the pores are so small. <clears throat> to illustrate that, I was um, considering the Freon Kern canal last night and it moves water the velocity of the water in the canal is about uh it moves water about a mile every 20 minutes or so um so if you could imagine you had the the magical capability to pull a mile of rock out of the subsurface in a column put it in the tilt it on its side put it in the freon turn canal fill the canal up <clears throat> with the flow rate the gradient the slope and the canal it would take tens of millions of years of water to flow through that rock. There's so much friction in those pores. So with that, that's some basic idea. Um, we'll go to the slides now. My, my mission from here is to provide some information on risk, because uh, that's obviously quite key to the, the social justice aspect of this. Where should these projects go? Should these projects go at all? Um, I should emphasize I'm a national lab scientist. So my job isn't to say these projects should happen. It's not to say they shouldn't happen. My job is just to develop information that society can use to make these decisions. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about three areas of risk, um, leakage via geologic features. So I described this column of rock and how long it would take a fluid to move through it. Uh, now there might be geologic features in it that allow that fluid to move more quickly, um, a permeable fault, uh, various other kinds of features. Um, I'll talk about leakage from via wells. 
Uh, so wells are essentially our canals into the earth. So we can create that fast path into the subsurface. And I'll end with um, leaks from pipelines if I have time. Um, oh yeah, I see Zoom. So uh, leakage via geologic paths. So this is a map of, and I don't expect you to see this in detail, and I will give the slides to the Kegley Institute. Um, I've tried to build this also as a future reference item. Um, so you'll have all these materials, whoever's interested to, to go ahead and proceed. Uh, so the reason I'm showing Illinois here is Illinois, um, to my knowledge, is the part of the country that has the most history with putting gases into saline reservoirs on the subsurface. And they did this for the purpose of storing natural gas. Um, we have natural gas storage facilities in California. They're all in old gas fields or oil fields. Uh, I won't go into why our society does this. Uh, that's, I can get into that if somebody wants to know. But in Northern Illinois, um, all of these facilities are in uh, locations and volumes that didn't have gas originally. It had water, salt water. And so it's somewhat analogous to where sequestration will need to go with um, carbon capture if it's to really scale up and become a big industry. And so it's provided a, a basis of history. And so of the 20 gas storage projects that started in these brine reservoirs, two of them leaked after they started operation, leaked to the near surface. Um, so about one out of 10 leaked. So with the technology, with the exploration ability, with the knowledge, the expertise they had at the time, very expensive projects, that was the best they could do at that time. Uh oh, it is frozen. I think it's frozen. I don't know if you can advance. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so we have better tools now, 50 years have transpired. And we have regulations, at least with regard to geologic carbon sequestration, that, that requires the use of such tools. It doesn't have to be exactly these tools, but there's a requirement to use more advanced tools than were used 50 years ago. Um, one of them is repeat seismic profiling. So this is a technology that's like ultrasound for the earth, uh, an ultrasound imaging for the earth. So you send sound waves down to the earth, you listen to what comes back, you build an image of the subsurface. And this can be done in three dimensions now. So to create like a cat, if you've ever seen a CAT scan, it'll make a three-dimensional volume of what's in the Earth subsurface. And it can be redone over and over again. And when the CO2 goes into the ground, it changes um, how those waves interact with the ground. And so it's possible to see where the CO2 is. Uh, another technology is repeat elevation measurements by satellite. We can measure elevations down to a millimeter or less now. Um, and so that can be repeated over and over again. You can actually see the Earth surface deforming as we put fluids in as we take fluids out. <clears throat> um, so in the, the last decade or two, there have been a number of carbon sequestration projects that have started up worldwide, including 10 that are industrial size, which is on the order of hundreds of thousands of tons to millions of tons. And none of these have leaked um, to date, uh, but it's a small sample size. Um, so we definitely want to emphasize that. Um, there was one project called Inshala in Algeria that was shut down um, when these tools, both of these tools were used and they discerned that they were starting to fracture the base of the rock that was holding the CO2 in. And so it started to get a fracture in that. And so they shut down the project. Um, so that one didn't leak, but it had to stop. So you can look at that either as a good story or not so good story. Um, there are no sequestration projects in California to date. Um, I would estimate that California is probably less susceptible to leakage than say this area in Illinois because the rocks here are quite young comparatively, uh, tens of millions of years old, which sounds old, but not that old compared to in Illinois, they're hundreds of millions of years old and they haven't really been hardened up. Um, so if there's a fracture in the rock, it's soft enough that it tends to close the fracture and seal it back up again. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, just go ahead from there. So I'm gonna move on to, to well leakage. Um, so the picture you see here is a picture of uh, what's some term chronic well leakage. This is a well that's leaking at such a low rate that society doesn't choose to immediately stop it. Um, what you're looking at specifically is the top of a well that's been abandoned. It has a steel plate that's welded on it, but the weld has degraded and there's some gas that has come up in the well and it's leaking out. Um, through that weld. 
So there's been some uh, surveys uh, in Canada at the province level and the US at the state level. And roughly, and I'm giving real rough numbers here, um, hopefully maybe it'll make it a little easier to remember, about 10% of oil and gas wells are found to have a leak. Now that might be they're actually leaking to air. This is generally leaking gas, uh, methane and other uh, gas constituents, um, or they might be leaking into, into the ground. Um, and they found that it's the average leak uh, is about 100 cubic feet a day, um, which again, is that large, is that small? That depends upon your perspective. Uh, my, my guess is that there will be um, a lower rate of wells that leak due to CO2 sequestration because the wells are deeper on average than wells worldwide for oil and gas development. Uh, by regulation, all wells used for CO2 sequestration are required to have continuous monitoring. And so it's much faster to pick up if something is going wrong, which is not required of oil and gas wells. Um, and then CO2, it turns out with when CO2 and water move through uh, well cement, let's say there's a crack in the cement that's between the pipe that is the well and the geologic material, when the CO2 moves through that crack, it actually causes the cement to seal up the crack. Um, so it turns out to be a fortunate. Um, didn't have to be that way, but it turned out to be that way. Um, so I'll move on to acute well leakage, sometimes referred to as well blowouts. Uh, the state defines a well blowout as, as any unplanned release of a fluid from a well, no matter how much. So technically chronic leakage is a blowout. Um, in general parlance, people think of a blowout as something dramatic, like what you see here, which is a picture of abandoned uh, well blowing out steam. Um, there's a lot of steam injection in Kern County to produce oil. And so uh, looking at actually Kern County and developing statistics for how often these events happen. Um, and then another researcher looked in Texas where they actually have a lot of CO2 injection to produce oil to enhance the production of oil. We come up with these, these statistics. And again, I've rounded them out. So about, um, there's about one blowout for about every 10,000 injection wells that are put into operation. So again, is that a lot? Is that a little? That is a policy decision. That is a societal decision. Um, there's about one blowout per every 100,000 injection well years. So that's, the first one is you turn on the well and it might blow out because it was constructed with a defect. The second one is the well is aging over time. And so the second, second one has to do with the aging. So that's about one out of every 100,000 well years. Uh, there's one blowout per 1,000 well rework operations. So this is when they open up the well. There's a crew and they open the well to do some work, um, fixing the well, changing the well. And that's, that's a particularly risky moment uh, because they have to keep the pressure under control in the well while they have the well open and they're moving tools in and out. Um, one per 5,000 plug wells. So you sort of get the idea here. And if you put all that together, so let's say you have a, a sequestration project that has one injector, one well to the reservoir to observe what's going on away from the injector and a, and a few plugged wells, you get about a likelihood of one blowout from every 400 projects, plus or minus. Is that again, is that a lot or a little? Now these are projects, you know, operating for 30 years, uh, the calculations based on a 30 year lifespan. Um, and again, I think this will probably be less, the, the rates will be lower for CO2 sequestration because again, the injection well has to be monitored continuously, which is not the case with oil and gas wells. Um, even like steam injection wells don't have to be monitored continuously. And also uh, CO2 injection wells have to be cemented all the way from the top to the bottom which is not true of oil wells and surprised me when I sort of moved um, into this domain in my career, the regulations only require cementing, say the bottom 500 feet of the well and the rest can be open. And so the pipe is just sitting in the hole, essentially um, exposed to the movement of fluids and whatever else is going on. So that those were the probabilities of a blowout occurring. Now, not every blowout is a, dramatic event like you saw a picture of. Some of them, uh, you know, um, somebody who's working on the well might make a mistake with the tool and break off part of the wellhead. Um, some fluid is coming out that's unplanned, uncontrolled, and they 
immediately, you know, flip a valve to shut down the well and it's, it's over. So you see this, this histogram, this is a range of the tons equivalent of CO2 that was released as uh, uh, methane releases in blowouts in Kern County in the study period of, of this paper. Um, so you can see it ranges dramatically. Uh, historically, there was only about one blowout in 15 in Kern County that immediately impacted the public within the study period, meaning a road got shut down, a, a residence um, got impacted by the fluids that were coming out. Um, so that kind of an impact. That is not to, that's, I emphasize immediate impacts because there's longer term chronic impacts, um, which is the basis of the, the setback law that just went into effect, the research on that. Uh, this is impossible to read. I don't expect you to read it. Um, uh, should, I, should I skip pipelines? How are we doing for time? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so maybe if there's questions, I can come back to this, but we'll move on from there. Thanks very much. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me to be here. Clickety-click. I'm gonna put some magic pixie dust on it while we're waiting. I got a six year old, so I always have it in bulk in my pocket. <laughs> while I'm waiting for the slide to appear, I will note that um, when I first started my journey of learning about all this stuff, and certainly one of the the things that I've learned the hard way many times is just because somebody, <laughs> you know, um, has a particular set of letters after their name doesn't mean that my lived experience has no value, right? So um, one of the things that I've learned, and certainly I probably represent where many so-called regular people are in terms of learning about these technologies, because I don't have that techno technical background, and I had to find information where I could find it, evaluate it for myself, and, and decide for myself, you know, how, how to feel about it, what to think about it, what conclusions to draw, et cetera. And one of the things I learned was that in this broad umbrella of carbon removal, and that, that's the phrase I like to use because given the climate problem, we're talking about needing to remove carbon from the air, needing to remove carbon from the oceans, needing to, um, to deal with that problem because just reducing emissions is not going to cut it, no pun intended. And so within that broad scope of carbon removal, CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, is just one type, right? There's a whole other host of other carbon removal solutions. Um, and certainly, I would hope that in the future, experts who are going to come in and talk about that can really illuminate that for us. Um, I do have a bachelor's degree in philosophy, and so in being invited to speak for the Kegley Institute is just really special for me. Um, and so I, I couldn't, you know, go and miss the opportunity to talk about epistemology just briefly. <laughs> How do we know what we know? How do we know what we know? And especially right now, that's a super, super important question. Super important question. How do we know what we know? So I'm approaching this technical, highly technical topic. And really, it's Truthfully, like you can put that technical aspect in a box and still evaluate things, you know, holistically, which I think very few people are doing that, by the way, not at the state level, not at the federal level, not at the local level, holistically, right? Putting the whole global picture together and not just being myopic, hyper-focused on one particular area. Who funds the person who's talking or the source that you're evaluating? Who funds them? I now get in my inbox every week multiple requests to engage in community engagement and help people find out what frontline communities want. And the first question I ask them is, who funds you? Why are they funding you? What are their interests and motivations? And I don't just look directly at the source. I try to go one, two, three, four degrees of separation beyond them as well, so that I can be really clear about the information ecosystem that surrounds them. What is their specific area of expertise, right? We heard some really important information about the geological aspects of carbon capture and sequestration, I'm not gonna go to In-N-Out and ask for orange chicken. You know what I'm saying? So I'm gonna go to my friends, the economists, to learn about the economics. 
I'm going to go to our folks, the geologists, to learn about the geolo geological aspects. Um, my technical understanding, I will tell you it's limited, and you can make of it and my evaluation of it what you will, especially in the energy context. If you look at the industries that have made the most money in human history, obviously oil and gas is right at the top, if not at the top. I looked it up and food processing is right up there too, right? With that amount of money over that period of time, and we're talking over 150 years, right? You're talking about an industry that has made a ton of money. And again, digging back into my philosophical roots, I always liked the idea of thinking about the four levels of happiness, right? Bob eats ice cream, goes yum. That's, you know, level one happiness. Level two is like, you know, um, I did something good for somebody. I feel good about that, right? And so on. When money enters into the picture, people tend to go, yeah, I can afford that awesome car now, right? We're at level one, level two, right? Um, really, the, the information and disinformation and the history of that in the oil and gas industry is something we have to acknowledge explicitly. We have to have that conversation. We have to have the conversation about the fact that, you know, the tobacco company and the companies and the, the, the strategies that they used, oil and gas company does the same thing. They're doing it now, right? Like my husband went to the Walmart on White Lane and he was asked to sign the referendum petition. And he was told that it was to basically like protect homes from oil and oil drilling. That's what he was told. And he was like, uh, yeah, I'm going to read this. Right. He's reading it and he's like, yeah, that's not what this says. That's not what this says. That happened this this year. Right. We have to have those real conversations, especially if we're going to be talking about the realm of ethics, ethics, conflicts of interest, honesty, um, commitment, promises. What does that mean? What does integrity mean? The other aspect I want to bring up, too, is. You know, when you have that amount of money, you really control the decision-making apparatuses in a society. I, I'm bleary-eyed because I just got back from Sacramento super late last night. Pretty much everybody we went to go see, they get money from oil and gas. Oil and gas, gives they give about a billion dollars a year in campaign contributions and lobbying. And, they, and we're going to see it here in a minute, what they get back for it. So ultimately, what I would hope everybody on the planet is doing in evaluating the climate change problem and the solutions that are being proposed for it, that they're asking some of these important questions and probably some of the ones that I've missed and deciding for themselves and not relying on other people to have some sort of magic pill, silver bullet, solve the problem. Because most solutions that are the best solutions are the boring ones. Shiny objects, we, we can't fall for that, for that um, shiny object. We evaluate proposed climate solutions, all climate solutions. And I saw a really cool one in the LA Times today. Um, a researcher at UCLA just announced that they have figured out how to remove carbon from the ocean. Super cool. Like I'll be evaluating that too and I'll be using this criteria. Is it sustainable? Is it economical? Is it effective? And there are two components to this. Is it a proven technology that we know does what they're saying it can do and can it do it at scale because and I hope you're going to talk about opportunity cost spending billions of dollars from the inflation reduction act on a particular technology we're not going to get that chance again we have to get it right is it safe does it burden marginalized communities and does it move us closer to a circular economy and and I had to look that up I was like what is a circular economy it's basically like, you know, everybody knows about reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Well, this is like, you're designing out any of the waste to begin with. You're engaging in economic activity that produces no permanent waste. And I think about this every day, just in my household, you know, um, I've, I've got an appliance that doesn't work anymore. What am I going to do with it? Is it going to end up in a landfill? What are we doing with those things? All When you aggregate that out and you extrapolate out from that, those are huge problems that we need to address. We're clearly in a throwaway disposable society. And on every level, that metaphor applies to so many aspects of our lives on this planet. And we just have to change our mindset about that. It's not right. The particular environmental justice position on CCS is this 
um, full statement here, and I encourage everybody to use the QR code to pull up the entirety of the statement and really understand it. And especially if you want to see kind of what the, the nitty gritty details are of it, it has really good explanations for why we have the positions that we have. We have signed on to this statement and we have shared it with the Department of Energy. We've shared it with our local oil and gas companies. We've told them this is how we are approaching CCS in particular. And I'll leave it up there because I see some people with their phone, they can grab it real quick. We signed on to this and, and I just really want to express profound gratitude to especially Center for Race, Poverty, and the Environment, CCEJN, CVAC, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. If you're engaging in a project in Kern County and you're not talking to those people the very next minute after you've thought about proposing something, then, then you're, not, you're not doing it right. You have to find your fiercest critics, and you know who they're going to be. Invite them to the table early, often, frequently, be transparent, disclose information. Really, really, really important. Key features of this platform, and, and I quote it, where state agencies are compelled to consider project applications, we urge that this list of common sense policy protections necessary for CCS, CCUS be first met. We oppose these projects. I used the criteria that I showed on the previous slide, and every project that we've been asked to support, we have declined to support. We've given a rationale for it. It takes a lot of time to do that, by the way. And in terms of capacity, when you work for a nonprofit, and you're being asked to support things because these applications require that 20% of the application be related to community engagement, but you're not recognizing the economic value of my time, and you multiply that out by like 30 people asking us to do the same heavy lifting. And again, this is technical stuff. I have to evaluate it myself. I have to include other people. I have to respect their time. Let's be really clear about what it means to involve the community, the full, full, true costs of doing that and doing it right, because it matters. We don't have time to get it wrong. So we do oppose pretty much all of these projects so far. We haven't seen even one yet that, that we can support. But we know it's going to happen anyway, right? Because of what I just said, a billion dollars of campaign contributions and lobbying goes a long way towards getting things to happen. In fact, the money that's in the Inflation Reduction Act for carbon capture and direct air capture, it was the case that um, using those technologies for enhanced oil recovery was removed from that regulation, but got put back in. Why? Lobbying. So we know they're probably going to be uh, approved anyway especially since the state of California has a prohibition on using carbon capture technologies for enhanced oil recovery. But so if they're going to happen anyway, let's, let's at least require that these conditions be met. Let's make sure they're not, you know, overburdening communities. The ones that have been burdened all along. I, I got my start as a teacher in Delano. I taught there for two years before I went to law school. And in the 10 years after I left, the principal died of cancer. My sixth grade teacher partner died of cancer, special education teacher behind me is in remission from colon cancer, the math teacher I carpooled with is in remission from colon cancer, an eighth grade student died of cancer, the 35 year old campus supervisor died of cancer, and another math teacher who's 38 and has a family of five died of cancer. It is not okay to overburden these communities that have already suffered so much. Those methane leaks, they're not just a statistic on the screen. My kids go to school two miles south of the ones that are featured in the paper. They've got to be powered by excess clean renewable energy. Not biomethane, hydrogen, not truly clean and renewable. It cannot be used to power CCUS projects. Electrolytic hydrogen powered by wind and solar is clean and renewable, but it should be reserved for those super rare circumstances where wind and solar with storage are not suitable to avoid the significant efficiency loss from using hydrogen. Hydrogen should only ever be generated by electrolysis powered by clean renewable energy, never from fossil fuels or biomethane. Additionally, CCUS should not be used as a mechanism to reduce potential hydrogen project CO2 emissions. 
I'm still trying to understand what that even means. So like legit, if you are also questioning and you want to know more, keep peeling back that onion because it is worth it to tackle this topic. We have to keep coming back to it. Not facing it is still a choice. And it's a choice to let other people who've been making the decisions all along make the same ones. So let's apply that platform briefly. We don't want to burden overburdened communities. That is the Cal Enviro screen heat map. The redder the color, the higher the percentile on the index for Cal Enviro screen, which basically maps out pollution and um, factors associated with poverty. So if you're in the 90 percentile, you're, you have very serious poverty and very serious pollution. When you look at this map for the entire state of California, the Central Valley is almost in its entirety red. We have the number one worst air quality in the country. I have cough drops on the table and I carry them with me everywhere because I don't know if at any time I'm gonna start coughing and I can't stop. My son has respiratory problems too, that he almost died when he was two years old. And we were told in no uncertain terms by the specialist who came up from UCLA to help him, that we needed to move and we just can't afford to do it, like so many people. And look where the pink dots are. Bioenergy with carbon capture sequestration, right there in McFarland, right there in Delano. The CCS projects in oil Oildale. Boy, if you're not from Bakersfield and you wanna see a visual impression of this entire situation, Go drive up Panorama. Take a look off the bluffs and sit with that because that's where they're putting these projects. We are, you know, trying to help others benefit from the journey that we've taken to try to understand this problem and to give all of the solutions, right? All the full panoply of solutions that are out there and, and help people wrestle with them and work with each other and talk to their friends and neighbors and bring people into the conversation. If we don't have every single resident of Kern County, at least up to a certain level of capacity of understanding what's happening in Kern County right now with regard to energy and climate um, approaches, then we have failed. Every person in Kern County, I'm, I'm here, but I don't represent frontline communities. They represent themselves. Right? If we're not knocking on doors in Allensworth to ask them what they need with the flooding, we're failing. If we're not going into McFarland and Delano and knocking on their doors and telling them, hey, this is what's happening in your neighborhood. Do you want to learn about it? Here's some information in English and in Spanish. Right? That's what it takes. We got to do it right. If the QR code is not working, by all means, call my um, colleague, Cecilia Delgado. She, she speaks Spanish as well. So if you've got folks who are Spanish speakers and you want to get them involved, low tech, no tech, this has no prior knowledge required at all. Join us. The conversation will be rich. It will be vibrant. It, it, it's necessary. And, and especially since this topic, more than any other issue that I work on, and, and I work on a lot of really difficult issues. I work on police accountability. I work on a lot of stuff. That's really hard. But this issue, more than every other issue I've ever worked on, has such a deep emotional component to it. I go back and forth between, man, we're screwed, <laughs> like, <laughs> to, um, okay, there's a pathway, and I see the pathway. And in fact, when I spoke at the summit for energy that Kern Community College District put on, and I was opposite a uh, representative of Western State Petroleum Association, I started by saying, we, I believe we can meet the challenge, but I don't assume that we will. So a little taste of something other than carbon capture that draws down carbon. And, I, and we, we can't just do a couple gigatons here and there, friends. Like if we're going to spend billions of dollars, let's get some bang for our buck. Let's draw down some real carbon, okay? This is an index that talks about all of the top carbon drawdown. That it's all been tested out and feasibility studies and everything. CCS is not on that list of the top ones that work. And in fact, like, and maybe it's on the next slide, I'll pull it up. Like in the grand scheme of things, carbon capture sequestration, the engineering version of carbon removal 
is like a drop in the bucket. It's like saying, you come to me, you're, you're, you're starving, you're thirsty, you need water, or you're going to die that minute. And I give you like, here's a drop. We good? Right? And, and I'll offer up some final thoughts with my, my little monkeys there. Um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just released a report on March 20th that if you haven't looked up the highlights, I encourage you to do it right now. Pull it up on your phones, check it out, try to absorb it, try to understand it. When my son is about 19 years old, and he's 12 now, and my daughter is 13 and she's six, the world will likely have surpassed its most ambitious climate target, limiting war warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. A temperature that still triggers tipping points. Um, we're, we're lucky enough, we're privileged enough, we're going to go to Alaska this summer. I took my son there when he was four years old in, in 2014. We're going to take pictures in front of those same glaciers, and they're not going to look the same. Greenland used to be a reflective white mass of ice sheet, and now because of the melting, it has darkened in color and it started absorbing heat. Just because most of the impacts are happening in the global south doesn't mean they're not happening. We're nowhere near meeting our greenhouse gas targets. And according to the International Monetary Fund, $5.9 trillion annually, governments are spending in subsidies to oil and gas companies. The IPCC report made it very clear, not only can we not drill anymore and add to our reserves of oil, we have to pull back the stuff we've already pulled out and not burn it. Why do we want to spend so much of our precious climate dollars on a technology that has only ever removed about three seconds worth of each year's global CO2 emissions? Why do we want one drop of water when we're dying of thirst? And with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to my new friend, Makunde. There you go. Thank you. You guys hear me? Oh, there you go. Okay, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming out here. Um, Preston and Laurie, thanks. You guys had a fantastic uh, presentation. So um, my name is Nyakundi Micheka. I'm an environmental economist. I work on natural resources. I work on in, um, oil and gas and, um, and a bunch of other stuff. So what I intend to do, my presentation today, is pretty much going to give us an overview of carbon capture and storage and towards the end of my presentation, I'll hope to get you guys to think like economists, okay? I'm going to have to um, sort of introduce the ways in which economists monetize or put a dollar value on the benefits and costs of carbon capture and storage, okay? So by the time I get to that point, hopefully we'll know what carbon capture and storage is. So now I'll just wait until my um, PowerPoint comes out. And I couldn't sit and talk at the same time. There's something about my voice it has to go vertically like that. Okay. I know, life is hard. Okay, just to get things started as, 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 um, as we go through this. So first of all, uh, an overview of my presentation. I'll start off by giving you guys um, an overview first. So this is, this is the table of contents, okay? People like to see these things because they're like, okay, when we get to environmental justice, we're done, okay? Um, so we'll start off first with how did we get here? Um, what if we do nothing about um, the issues that we're going to discuss? Possible solutions. Then I'll talk a little bit about why Kern County, then move on to the economic benefits and costs, and then kind of talk ab about environmental justice, okay? So the first thing is how did we get here? Now, this is just an image that shows that, um, you know, we're talking about carbon dioxide emissions and nature has a way of storing CO2 over time. It has stored this. This is something that has been going on. But after 1950, the amount of CO2 that we have put out there has been a lot, which is shown by this graph right here, right? As of May 2023, which is not, well, not, sorry, not May, but April 2023, the amount of CO2 that we've put out is about 423 parts per million, okay? 423 ppm, like 423, what's ppm? PPM is parts per million. So if there are a million molecules of air, 
423 of those would be CO2, okay? So that's um, where that thing that shows current is, okay? And that graph needs to go down right, right to around 285, okay? So over this has happened over the last 70-ish years and a lot of CO2 out there. So what if we do nothing and this schematic here, this graph just shows some of the things that would happen, not all of them, it's not exhaustive. Um, coastal flooding will cost us about 5% of global GDP in 2100. In 2100. There are going to be heat-related breaks, right? It's going to be hot. Some of us will need to take breaks, and all that has an effect on the economy, on the macroeconomy, right? Remember, macroeconomy is everything that is micro. Energy demand is also going to increase. It's going to be hotter. It's going to be cooler in some areas. It's going to cost us some more money to cool our houses or to keep them warmer. And global hydro potential is going to increase. So we're going to be able to increase the amount of electricity we produce from, um, from hydropower, okay? So in the US, um, this was put out by the Office of Management and Budgeting. They say that we could lose about 2 trillion each year. So just to think about this, the US GDP is about 25 trillion this year, but you know, going to 2100 would be losing about 10% um, each year based off of the estimates that were put out there. And these are numbers that have been put out every year and things are, are, are happening. Okay, I don't know whether you guys at the back can see all this, but this chart is actually pretty awesome. But what it tells us is that it tells us the sources of carbon dioxide, CO2. Where does the CO2 that we're talking about, where does it come from, okay? And you'll see that on the extreme left, right? For you guys left, um, the extreme left, you'll see that that shows where the emitting source is. And then the next column shows you the amount of emissions that come from those sources. So one thing you'll notice is that coal to power, which is producing electricity from coal, produces about 9,031 metric you know, CO2 per year, okay? That's a lot. And if you go down all the way to alum aluminum production, you'll find that that goes to around eight. And then the next column, shows you the cost of capturing from each of those sources, okay? So on average, coal to power is co will cost you about 58 to $74 per ton of CO2, okay? So that's where a lot of the CO2 is coming from, coal to power. A lot of it comes from fossil powered sources. So coal to power, natural gas to power, petroleum to power. And then the other ones, which are blue, you know, cement production, iron and steel, those are industrial sources. So those industrial sources put out CO2 in the air. And the amount of CO2 that's put out by concentration varies. There are high CO2 sources and low CO2 sources, meaning um, if you were to get that much you know, of uh, waste gas, you may have a large concentration of CO2 or you may have a very small concentration of CO2. So that varies through that list, okay? And that's gonna be a big issue because when it comes to separating, getting the CO2 out of that, air or that waste gas that I talked about, it's gonna be an issue because it costs a lot of money, okay? So there are a lot of issues, uh, well, not a lot of issues, there are a lot of ways in which you can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And this graph just kind of, or this schematic or table just shows the various ways in which you can, you can get it out through agroforestry, through crop residues, through direct air capture and storage, which is the, the shaded, um, the darker one, and from um, enhanced weathering and all of those. So there are very many ways to get the CO2 out of, out of um, the air. So what is CCUS, okay? Carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So what we're saying is that we want to capture carbon dioxide, right? We want to, there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the air. In fact, if I, what I was thinking, I was thinking about this late earlier on. I wish we, when, before this started, we could put CO2, CO2, like just little things in the air so that we can actually visualize what we're trying to get out of the atmosphere, right? But what we're trying to do is to get that CO2 out and put it back into the ground or put it or convert it into sources that we can actually use, right? Cement and some of these um, really cool things. So carbon capture, utilization and storage is getting that CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it back down, uh, maybe in depleted oil and gas reserves or saline aquifers. Now that we know what CCUS is, we can also talk a little bit about direct air capture. So these are big machines, which pretty much suck in air, and once you get this air, remember there's some CO2 in that, you need to separate the CO2 and the air and take that CO2, convert it into something, transport it somewhere and either store it or use it for something. So that's what direct air capture means. So I've described CCUS and DAC, okay? So I'm gonna use those words a lot, okay? 
So why direct air capture? Direct air capture is pretty good because one of the advantages of DAC is that it is a method of removing CO2 from the air from, you know, up, it's, it's, it's an additional way of getting CO2 out of the air because you can see like some of the things like logistics and trucks and air travel, all that stuff um, has CO2 that's put out into the atmosphere and direct air capture actually works really well in getting that stuff out of um, the air. The cost, there's some technologies out there. Some of these companies like carbon engineering, it costs approximately $94 to $232 per ton. Climeworks costs about $600. Um, the technology used by Climeworks costs about $600 to $800 per ton of CO2. So um, this is an, an ongoing technology and, and there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening. This graph here shows the areas where it is attractive to set up DAC facilities in the country. The darker the green, the more attractive it is. So the reason why I put that is you can see Kern County on, you know, in the, the part of California is actually, you know, it has some suitability for this, okay? And I'll talk a little bit about that. Well, just to give you a secret or just kind of tell you what's gonna happen is um, we have some geologic storage facilities because we're producing a lot of oil and we can put some of that CO2 back into those areas. And um, yeah, I'll get to, to the other one when I, when, when I get to that point. Costs. How expensive is carbon capture? Answer is it depends, okay? A lot of people like to ask how much it, does it cost, but it depends. And people don't like the answer, it depends, because they want to be told, is it bad, is it good? We don't want, it depends. So it, why does it depend? It depends, one, on the project that you're trying to, to, to work on. Two, the CO2 partial pressure. Remember I talked about air and CO2 and taking it out? That activity of taking it out costs a lot of money, people. It costs a lot of money, okay? So that costs a lot. Also the source that you're getting the CO2 from also um, will affect the price that you're going to, um, you know, put in to get that stuff out. The value chain, transportation, where are you taking this CO2? Are you taking it across the country? Are you taking it across the county? Are you taking it to 10 miles down? What are the regional issues surrounding the activity that you're trying to do? And then the technologies. So just to kind of go quickly over those things, um, costs are project specific. So if you're getting carbon dioxide from high purity sources, the costs would be very different from if you were getting from natural wells. The second thing is the partial pressure. That little schematic kind of shows what I've been talking about. Okay, you get it out of that. How am I doing on time, Nate? I could, I'll keep it going, okay. And then the third one is um, the value chain, okay? Once you get the CO2 out of the ground, you gotta take it to where it's either used or stored and all those costs add up. Transportation, if, are you transporting this by pipeline, by trucking, by ships? How, how, how does that um, factor in? And all those are going to be costs which are going to be factored in. And then this graph here kind of shows some of the sources of CO2 in California. So those dots show where you can get CO2 by industry or by, you know, by, 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 by purity source. And this graph here, which shows the green, shows where it can be stored. So you need pipes to move that stuff from the dots to the green stuff, okay? Logistics, value chains. Other things include labor costs, taxes, topography. If you were to have this project in California versus another state, maybe Alaska or Arizona, costs would be very different. And then there's also a fluctuation of revenues and incentives and technological advance, advancement. I'm gonna skip through this and just kind of move on to the benefits of carbon capture and storage if we were to do this in, in Kern County. One, there would be jobs during construction, okay, and operation. And as we get to this, I also wanna get you guys to think through this. As, in, as economists, what we do is we look at the problem as a whole, okay? We're not, you know, we, we're looking, we need to look at the benefits. When we look at the benefits, we need to look at the benefits to the whole economy, to the company that's doing it, to the region that's doing it, to, you know, to folks who have not been born, right? Years to, to come. So in terms of benefits, um, if we were to do this in Kern County, there would be jobs in construction and operation. Because carbon dioxide can also be used in enhanced oil recovery, it can also support some of the jobs in the oil and gas industry. Third, there would be reduced CO2 emissions. And the cool thing with some of these DAC projects is that they do not require arable land. You can set them up you know, in places where there's a lot of CO2 or little CO2 or other pre-existing projects. Number five, it's location independent, and then there's also efficient land use. I put number seven, then I put dot, 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 meaning there are more benefits that I just didn't have time to put there. And I wanted my slides to have font size 32, all of them. So 
life is hard. Costs, costs of carbon capture and storage in, in Kern County. One, we need to factor in the externalities of doing this. If you're going to put up construction sites, we need to capture the costs of traffic, the cost of dust, the cost of noise, and we need to monetize that, okay? Second, we also need to incorporate land competition, okay? Um, you know, what, what, what are we displacing or what are we putting this facility next to? In terms of pipelines, we need to factor in risks of leakage, seismic activity, water pollution. We also need to factor in the costs of tourism. If we're putting this next to, I, I put there Joshua Trees and Rivers, if you're to put this next to Joshua Trees and, 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 and places where the river, how would that affect the cost of tourism, right? Um, the impact on communities' health and the impact on economy. So land values, if you have your home right there, how does your home get impacted by these projects being cited right next to you? So we need to factor in all this and, and actually do, um, do this, okay? I'll go this, then I'll go to the previous slide, okay? So when you do your benefit cost analysis, you need to take all those things that I talked about, get the benefits, get the costs, put them in a monetary value, and then look at these years you know, to come, then assess whether this is a project worth going for or not. In terms of environmental justice, I think Laurie did a good job of explaining, you know, you were talking about the fair treatment and meaningful treatment of all people um, with respect to development and implementation of projects. So this means having them um, participate in the decisions that are to be made. And, um, you know, it's, it's very, very important to have those discussions with them. Finally, some thoughts. Okay, this is the last one, Nate, I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. Um, the last slide in terms of this is just some thoughts. The interesting thing with setting up these projects is one, you need to think about the extent or the scale of the people who are going to be affected. If we were to set up a project, maybe set up a dam or a carbon captures plant right here, we need to assess how far would the effects of this project go? Is it gonna be zip code? Is it gonna be county level? Is it gonna be state level, right? So we need to understand the scale or the extent of the market. Two, are there gonna be county to county spillovers, right? If we say we're providing jobs, but people are coming from out of state, how is that going to impact the revenue that we have right here in Kern County, okay? Remember, I'm getting guys to think about these things, okay? I don't have the answers. Um, raw materials. A lot of these projects, we say we are going to set up, you know, we're, we're going to um, put this fantastic carbon capture project right here. Where are those raw materials? Are they coming from the Kern County or are they coming from outside? We need to factor in that because if they come from outside, those costs are a little bit different. If they come from inside, those costs are a little bit different. Regional issues, CO2 is a public good. Carbon dioxide is a public good, right? A public good is, is, is a good where, you know, to think about CO2, if we were to get CO2 out of California and our neighbors are not getting it out of, you know, their regions, then how do we, you know, how do we factor all of that? So we need to really think about that. Intergenerational issues, right? Because we have, we need to think about the costs and benefits beyond um, our generation. We also need to think about public policy and probably use market-based instruments to support some of these policies. Uh, their taxes, their, you know, their command and control, all of those things are, 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 are things that need to be uh, discussed. And then finally, this is a work in progress. So there are a lot of new technologies a lot of folks are working on this, but it's important to have these discussions. I hope we're done. Let's keep in touch. Thank you so much, people. Sorry, I took that. So, so let's thank all three of our panelists here for those presentations. So we, we have about 20 minutes tonight. We're going to end our event at 7.30 for audience question and answers. So we have two microphones, as I mentioned here. If you'd like to ask a question of one of our panelists, um, I'll ask you to come to one of the microphones on the side, and I'll uh, call on people from there. Um, we also have uh, people on Zoom. So if you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A function. I'm like looking at the sky, the people in Zoom up there somewhere. Um, but uh, you've... Uh, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom to enter a, a question there, and then we'll read it to our panelists um, here in the room. So, um, yes, and if you would introduce yourself, too, and please uh, frame your comment as a question, too, we'll ask. So let's go ahead first on this side over here. 
Hello, my name is Karen Urso. I come in out of the uh, community health uh, field, and I just want to ask um, how, 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 I'm so glad that health has been at the table and it was mentioned by all three panelists. And how are our cancer rates going to figure into some of this? Because um, over the past few years, cancer has surpassed heart disease as the leading cause of death in Kern County. Usually that suggests an aging population. We don't have an aging population. So the risk is coming from somewhere else. What kind of research is being done and how is that gonna be factored in to these decisions? Who would like to take that question? Lori, you brought up the issue of thinking about cancer. And initially, do you wanna take, a, you kind of thinking about it or Preston, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that um, that's not my area of research, sociology uh, and public health, those impacts. Um, but it is something to worry about in terms of is the state taking a holistic look at where these projects go or are they just going to happen? I know when I've asked the same question, um, a variety of different thoughts have come to mind based on what I've been able to dig up. And I'm by no means an expert, like you're coming to in and out and asking for orange chicken on this one. But um, when I read an article in um, the journal Nature about innovation in academic research, plummeting, <laughs> plummeting, and um, a lot of the analysis of that article um, hinted at, you know, the systems of academic research funding. And so I really think the answer to your question has to include a consideration of who, who is incentivized to fund that research and who is disincentivized, to, who is gonna wanna oppose it, right? Or um, for example, I'm aware that, you know, our fracking water, you know, is processed and sold to farmers and, and put on crops, right? And a number of different studies have been done related to that water and is it safe? But something that a lot of people don't realize is the fact that a lot of the components of the um, fracking chemical makeups is trade secret. And so it's not revealed what's actually in that frac fracking water. How can you test for something that is being hidden and not there's no transparency around it? So I would really encourage us to look at the full scope of what we would hope the research is looking into. And if it doesn't exist, incentivize funding it and if there's no like incentive to fund it, then require it. Like we can ask for that to be included in the in the budget. And probably California is the best state uh, in the position to make those kinds of budget asks, even though it is on the chopping block, all our climate related um, funding. And so definitely I encourage everybody to contact your elected leaders and say, look, we got to bake that climate stuff into the budget in every aspect. If we're addressing homelessness, if we're addressing, you know, it, it's got to have climate baked into that so we can get every, every bang for every buck. Yeah. Um, whoa. Um, so the way I think about that is, um, you know, if, if, if we're looking at cancer, the first question you'd want to ask is, okay, how are the rates in Kern County changing? And then ask, are these rates just in Kern County or are they statewide or you know nationwide things? Um, if these numbers are changing in the same way across the country, then that's something we need to look at across the country. But if it's in Kern County and perhaps in a smaller region, then now we can start to drill down and ask the correct questions as to what's really going on in that particular region. So that's what, that's I think how I would approach that. But I'm thinking as an economist. So I think someone who's doing medicine would probably do better. <laughs> No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you for the question. We're going to go to this side over here. Thank you. Uh, I was. Uh, my name is Romeo Astrano. I was actually a student of uh, Professor Olson a, a while back. I don't know if he remembers me, but I, do, yeah. I did work uh, in oil for eight years at Elk Hills, and it's a 75 square mile uh, lease, and it's one of the largest in the United States. And my concern is that when you... Uh, uh, they're proposing it. Uh, Vicky Kolob, the CEO of Oxy, uh, is saying that they're going to make more money off of that uh, carbon capture and sequestration than their oil. But my concern is in in California, at particularly at the Elk Hills, um, 
I, I don't know, maybe ge the geologist could shed some light on it, but I don't know how separated everything is, you know. Uh, down, I, I remember we were already injecting carbon dioxide into the ground to get the oil out without using so much electricity. And so how do you uh, guarantee to the people that um, you're not double dipping, right? You're not getting uh, tax breaks <laughs> to in inject the carbon dioxide and then uh, at the same time getting it out of the ground again, uh, you know, at, at no cost and then making the world just a lot worse. And I, from what I understand, they're, they're solidifying it. But the article that I read recently is that <clears throat> they're using the solid carbon to get the oil out of the ground. How do you, uh, do you wanna? Um, so my understanding is state law at this point uh, prohibits injecting CO2 to enhance oil recovery. Um, I don't know if that went into effect this year, actually, it just passed. Um, so presumably CRC is not planning to do that. And in terms of the question of, uh, Good question. If you sequester CO2 in one, one reservoir, one porous rock body, how do you know that the pressure isn't helping you get oil out of the next one over? Yeah, they're all interconnected, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there would be ways in terms of engineering to monitor for that. I don't know that that is required in the law currently. So that's maybe a policy idea uh, for when. CO2 is going to go into a reservoir that is among many reservoirs that there has to be some monitoring look at the pressure between at the points of the link possible linkages. Um, so yeah, you might want to go to your state assembly member. Great. Thank you for your question. It's good to see you too. Um, we're going to go back to this side for a question. So good evening, everybody. So I enjoy the discussion today. So I'm uh, my name is Antje Lauer. I'm a microbiologist here at CSUB and I have a question about safety. So the third domain of life are the archaea. And when you are thinking about sequestering carbon, CO2, in the deep biosphere, this is the home of the archaea, namely methanogens. So what is the risk assessment of sequestering CO2 in the deep subsurface where methanogens might be present and then it might maybe backfire on you that all the CO2 is coming out as methane. What is the risk assessment? What are the research results so far? Thank you. Yeah, so I don't, um, that's not an area of research that I've worked in and it's not uh, something I'm aware has been researched a great deal, um, given that carbon dioxide is sort of the oxidation state for carbon and in general, with the, our use of the subsurface, we haven't, um, I think, in our environmental assessments, paid attention to what microbes may be there. So that would be, I think, somewhat of a perspective change, which is not to say it shouldn't happen. Um, but you're asking sort of, as I understand, sort of a two, two prong question. One is, will the microbes that are there um, cause the project to fail or do something that it wasn't planned to do? And the other is, what is the impact? on Archaea itself. And that's not my knowledge. I'm, you know, I'm one person. It's there's thousands of people working on this, but I have not run across 15 years that I've been working on this. I just hope that before we start doing anything like this, that this should be deeply researched because we could make actually climate change worse by doing this. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tim, do we have a question? You want to take a question from Zoom here? Oh, did we have the microphone? It's, should we good? Hello. There we go. There we go. Have dairy and agriculture companies been involved in plans for CCS in Kern County alongside those for petroleum? I asked our ag, ag commissioner this exact question. And he said to his knowledge, he's not aware of any collaboration happening. That's a quick one. Um, we can, we want to take one more from there, Tim, and then we will go back into the room where we're good for now. Okay, let's go over here for our next question. Uh, my name is Karim Salehu from physics and engineering department. Uh, 
I saw some information about the cost of capturing carbon dioxide and storing it. Uh, do we know any of any technology that can actually capture carbon dioxide and store it without producing more than it captures and stores? It's called a tree. <laughs> so it exists? Yeah, in fact, um, that's why I asked the Ag Commissioner that question about these soil-based and land use natural land solutions, because you're talking about, you know, that we, we have a oh, great- Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry, when I said exist, I didn't notice oh. that you said trees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, besides trees, I have another problem with the trees. Trees could be useful a thousand years ago where we didn't have water. Now with every tree that we plant, we remove some water from the circulation. We cannot afford plant trees to capture carbon dioxide and then leave deprive ourselves from water. So not to mention we are not even uh, talking about the space that is needed. Just the water, extra water that is removed from uh, circulation and is stored in trees. Each tree has 30% of mass of each tree is water, something like that. So with, with each tree that we plant, as it grows, we take water from circulation, rainwater, and then uh, will be stored. And we cannot afford to do that when it comes to tree. But besides tree, besides using tree. Yeah, so that's why when I think about this problem, I think about it globally, because there's going to be a certain global capacity for growing trees. And in fact, um, when I went to the Esri user conference last year, there is a gentleman in the, the British military who put into action a uh, tree planting project on lands where they're doing military exercises. And he planted, they, he made sure that he was planting the right trees. And indeed it, it became a, a regenerative outcome that had tremendous, tremendous carbon management benefits, right? In Kern County, maybe that's not the right move, but it's also not the right move to let green spaces exist only on the west side of Bakersfield, right? It's also important that we're looking at using cover crop. It's also, because that builds soil resiliency, which also will impact positively some of our flooding problems. And nobody's really engaging in that regenerative cover crop type technique. This is why I asked earlier, we need an expert here who can speak to the regenerative practices that we can employ now. And I'll tell you right now, I went to the Farm Bill listening session to ask these questions. I was not allowed to speak. Nobody who had those kinds of questions was allowed to speak. So if we're not having the conversation now about how to use natural systems to heal what needs to be healed, and we're only looking to an engineering solution, th then we're not going to solve this problem. I want to, since I am personally involved. I think, let's go, did you want to, Dr. Pacheca, did you want to respond? Yeah. Um, yeah, just to add on to what you said, sorry. Um, I think there are, there are a number of solutions out there, and this is a very um, growing field. The area of carbon capture and storage is quite, um, it's developing a lot. The soil sequestration, we know about bee backs. Um, it, we have some technology where, um, you know, they're dealing with putting up particles on the ground, which, you know, take CO2 out of the ground. But all of these things have a cost. Uh, if you were to look at the, the whole life cycle process of all these uh, activities, there's some CO2 produced along the way. But I think it's a developing issue in terms of finding the best or the most efficient. And we also need to be conversant that, you know, we, 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 we need solutions. We need to think about these solutions fairly quickly because um, at the rate at which we're going, we're going to be seeing a lot of um, losses. 
if, if we could, I'm, I'm sorry, we're about out of time here. If we could go to our, our next question, if, if you don't, and we can talk more after the event is over, if you would. Okay. Do you mind? I really... No, we, I think let's oh, go to okay. our next, the person okay. behind you for your ne the next question, and then we can, we can talk more after the event is over. Okay. I would like to get to the next question. We can come back. I'll try to be quick. I'll, I'll try to be quick if that's okay. Do you want to line up behind me, sir? Let's line up behind me. I'm going to be quick. So, sir, she also has a question here, and we're almost out of time. And, you know, I think my question actually would have been a good last one, too, so maybe I should have. <laughs> um, so I really love the conversation that's been, oh, I should introduce myself. My name is Jennifer sanchez Biederman. I am the Campus Sustainability Manager now at the CSU Chancellor's Office, had the opportunity of um, working on sustainability and energy here at CSU Bakersfield. Um, I love the conversation and I wanna hear more of it. I think that what I hear often from students, especially with this climate problem, is a lot of doom and gloom. But what I also hear people saying is when we talk about the, the climate problem, we have to end with the climate solutions in order to really positively move forward. So I know there are a lot of climate solutions and Laura, you talked about them at the, uh, I think you might've had project drawdown on your slide, right? So that, I love that project, so many good stuff out there. So I'm aware of an important, and know how important the opportunity cost is that we talked about. Um, I also uh, want to make sure we get it right you know, of course, because it's so important. So I'm just wondering, is this being um, the opportunity cost specifically, is it being looked at by any organization such as Project Drawdown, such as other organizations? And then I have a, a second one if you have time for it, but yeah, that was my go. first question. There we go, great, thanks. What was the question? No, I'm just so uh, I think the question here you're asking is the way, you know, are we doing enough to really understand what the opportunity costs of coming up with CO2 solutions? Is that what the question is? Correct. The opportunity cost of funding that more so or incentivizing it more so than other solutions. Um, yes. That would be an interesting research question, actually. Um, uh, so what you're doing is you're saying you're looking back and saying, you know, we're putting money here you know, why are we putting money here? And, um, you know, the way I can, what, one thing I can think of, and, and this is an example I use in class, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we pay a tax on gasoline and um, that tax, that money that's, that we pay to put gas in our pump, some of that money is taken to fund projects that actually remove CO2 out of the atmosphere or to, to you know, to, to work on emissions. So I would say that, uh, it's it's sort of a reinforcing problem where you have you know you have something that's going on here and 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 people are being you know people are being charged for it and those resources are being used to fund um, a solution so it would be interesting to look at that I mean uh, I just don't have a direct answer for what you had but I think that's that's just the way I can think about it yeah am I making sense or not you are you sure this guy is a little bit just looking at me. <laughs> I can offer that uh, while not my field, there are researchers who, the way I think of it, they look at the solution stack by cost. Um, so there's graphs that stack up uh, the cost of CO2 removal and how much CO2 could be removed by that method. And they stack them up to from you know, low cost or even some that produce that benefit. They don't cost anything, they actually provide revenue um, to more and more expensive. and and sort of cut the line on, okay, this, this is as much as we need, so we'll do these and we won't do these. Um, and the state of California, the Air Resources Board, uh, went through an exercise like that recently. It's called the scoping plan. You can look it up online. And it analyzed a number of scenarios for how California would meet its goals. Um, and so it has that kind of analysis in it, which I call energy pathway analysis. So it's not so much you know, do this or do this. It's what is the full portfolio of things that we need to do? So yeah, there are some resources out there. 
Lori, would you like to address that? And I think that will that will be our our last question. We're at our our time here. Um, so I think, you know, it's a complicated topic. We've addressed a number of the aspects of it tonight, but we've also only gone so far with that, as you can see with some of the questions that, and this is only one part of a number of conversations happening in our community and thinking about this future and thinking about carbon capture and sequestration and what, how to do this, how to do it effectively or whether to do it at all. So I thank all of you for coming tonight for this event. Um, encourage you to be part of future conversations in our community and to come tomorrow as we think more about the question of sustainability at our sustainability symposium, um, including a, a lecture at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. So um, thank you again for coming and um, have a good evening. Okay. Yeah.